What a thrill it is to welcome onto the program a gentleman whose testimony, life story, and musical abilities have been a blessing for a long time, but blew my doors off when we saw his life story played out on Amazon Prime just a few days ago is when I watched it. It's called I Still Believe. And joining me in the interview of Russ Taff is my friend Billy Petty, who is also the worship pastor at Hopevale Church. As we welcome in the man himself, Mr. Russ Taff. How are you, sir? Guys, I'm doing great. It's good to be with you today. Well, thank you for doing this. Uh, I can't imagine how much your phone has been ringing off the hook since I Still Believe came out because it had to have touched deeply in the hearts of everybody who has seen it. So what's reaction been like thus far? Well, it's, it's been worldwide. I mean, a lot of different countries have, have watched it. And uh, I, just, I just felt when they asked me to do the interview, I do the documentary uh, two, three years ago, I guess. Uh, my wife asked me, do you want to be dishonest? And, uh, but the people that did the documentary, they knew part of my story and asked me if I would, but once I shared it, once I told my secret, it gave people to, to tell their secrets because they saw me step forward and say, Hey, you know, uh, this Grammy dove winning guy that's been traveling for 42 years on the road for Jesus has had a problem that, that, um, that he has struggled with most of his life. And, uh, but I knew telling my secret back years ago was the only way to get well and not hide. I think so many of us go to church every Sunday holding a secret and afraid people will find out or just that, that, that thing in us that's keeping us from really, really, really staying connected to Jesus. But people can be so judgmental and hard and cruel at times. We're kind of gun shy to, uh, let people in because we don't know how they're going to react. And I didn't either. So the response has been overwhelming with people writing in and, you know, they don't know me. They're sending me an email or, uh, or a, a Facebook, that, that sort of thing. And, and, and telling me their secret because they, they know I don't know them, but you know, just saying it out loud to somebody, this is what, you know, I, I've been needing help in my life with. And I, I just want to say it out loud to somebody that understands. So go back to the question. It has been overwhelming, the response that we've gotten these last two years from around the world. Uh, Russ, I was just going to say, I was at a, about 25 years ago, I was at a worship conference, and I heard somebody say, uh, oftentimes God will take your misery and make it your ministry. And um, yeah. that, that phrase has stuck with me for a long time, and I... Um, I certainly saw that come to life uh, in, in what you just said. I mean, with how many people um, feel the permission, maybe, to, to deal right. with this now, and, and maybe you're opening some doors that n- maybe never would have opened. I mean, I, I, your story was incredible. I loved watching that on Amazon Prime, and uh, I'm so uh, blessed by your honesty, you and your family and your, your kids and the people around you. It was just, it was so moving. So obviously the ministry that you have in this, you'll probably keep seeing that as my guess as the days. Well, go uh, I, I, and I like that. I'm excited about that too. Whatever years God has me left, you know, uh, out here singing, preaching for him to be able to share about his miraculous power to change lives and, and to be a safe place for people. I'm not going to judge you. You know, my world has been broken apart and God put it back together. You know, I am sympathetic to wherever you are in your struggle or or what's ever going on in your life. And there's so many things that plague us as Christians. But, you know, and we we both have all have heard this, uh, you know, that church should be a hospital. But it should be a place that we can go and say, hey, man, you know. I'm dealing with something and it's kicking my butt day after day after day. And I need help. And can I tell you, and and you not judge me, you know, can you help me? Uh, And I was gun shy for so many years because I didn't know who to trust. And, you know, when you're, you live in a glass house 
and uh, people watch you constantly. And, um, and so you learn to hide because you're ashamed. You're just ashamed of, of how life has taken you and, and decisions that you've made. Uh, and so many times it was just, just to get through and just to kind of go back to the beginning of my story. Um, and you guys move me along cause I can get long winded talking about this stuff. Um, but I grew up in a household. My dad was a Pentecostal preacher and also an alcoholic. So, um, you know, one Christmas we'd be in church and he'd be preaching for like six, eight months to a year. Uh, and then out of nowhere, he would disappear for three or four days and drink. Um, and we would get thrown out of that church. So, uh, and the, the thing that broke my heart, you can't have a drunk pastor, but when I was 13 and my dad relapsed and, and it was a small church of about 25 people and mainly family. Uh, and my deal was I couldn't play sports, but all like, you know, I could sing and started at six, seven, eight through there. And like so many of us in church, we do, you know, we, we, we grow up singing and, and being a part of the choir. Uh, but my deal was Sunday night, I would learn a song. I was like 12, you know, I started playing guitar when I was 11. So, um, and Sunday night was my deal. Uh, you know, I'd take my acoustic and go down there and, and, and dad, and I would sing, you know, that was, that was kind of my, my outlet. And after dad relapsed and they threw him out, I had my little cardboard box guitar and I showed up at the church, you know, like I, I've done for years. And my uncle stopped me at the door and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, uncle, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it's Sunday night. I'm here. I'm, I, I'm, I want to be in service and sing my song. And he said, you're not welcome here. And I said, well, uncle, I, di I didn't do anything wrong. And he said, well, you're his son and we don't want you here. I watched my dad that, you know, people would tell him uh, elders in the church that, you know, if you're thinking about relapsing again, you know, talk to us, talk to us. And he tried that once. And before, uh, before the day was out, it was all over town that he was tempted to drink again. And, and, uh, and he was shunned just for having saying out loud, you know, I'm thinking about relapsing, but it was a really small, uh, country church, uh, migrant workers, um, um, factory workers. It just saying there wasn't a lot of wisdom, not, not a lot of wisdom, just simple folks that love Jesus. And they did love Jesus, but, the gospel that they served and the Jesus that they served was so judgmental and hard and, and uh, did not like them very much. Well, and how, for me, go ahead. How, how did that not drive you in the opposite direction? You know, you've spent a career singing gospel music, and it, it would have made perfectly logical sense if all those experiences that you're describing, if you said, I don't want anything to do with this whole world the rest of my life, look how cruel, judgmental, and hypocritical they can be. Why didn't that happen? Well, it happened uh, right after that experience. And, you know, just to go in a little bit deeper in the story, there is this, there is this thing uh, between a parent and a child. It's called covert incest. It's not physical touching, but it's you take a child as a spouse, basically, to talk to them as an adult because you can't talk outside the family. One of the worst whippings I ever got in my life, I was nine years old, and I told my little friend that mom and dad had an argument, and mama beat the fool out of me for that, uh, that I would talk outside the family, that there was a problem inside the family. So she couldn't do that either. She couldn't talk outside the family, but she chose me when I was 11 and she would come into my room and I have to sit up and she would just dump on me. I had three older brothers. Why she chose me? I don't know, but she would tell me that we're probably not going to be able to, well, we're going to lose the house cause we can't make payments. Dad's not working. I can't make enough money. She said, and, uh, uh, and, and tell me how bad things were and how scared she was. 
And then she would feel better and go back to her room and go to sleep. Well, I'm sitting there. What do you do with that? You know, when you're 11, 12 years old, what, what? And you can't talk to anybody. So my, uh, I'd heard somewhere along the line that Jesus was a friend and you could talk to him. Um, so mama had a key to the church and I would sneak down there, uh, after like 1030 at night, you know, 12, 13 years old, it started. I would sneak down there at night and I would, um, crawl down. I mean, walk down to the front of the church, a dark church. And man, when you're 12, it's scary in a dark church, but, and there was a little lamp up by the stage and it's a small little church, but I didn't want to turn the lights on. And, uh, night after night, after night, after night into years, I would sit there and just talk to Jesus. I would tell him how scared I was. I, I would tell him, you know, I, I don't know what to do. My home life is falling apart. Nobody, you know, when there's, when there's addiction and trauma in a home, you know, you can stay out to five in the morning. Nobody cares. So my only connection to help at all was going down there night after night and, and kneeling at the altar or sitting on a pew and crying and telling Jesus how scared I was. And when I would do that, I would feel better. And, um, and then it would happen again. Mom would come into my room. And so when she finished, I would sneak out and go down to the church and I would you know, kneel at the altar, talk, talk to, uh, Jesus and just tell him how scared I was and we developed a relationship that was outside the church. It was outside of Christian people. It was outside that judgmental hard. It was just he and I, and I really believed that he cared. And so that carried me. And that built a relationship with him that, that, uh, away from all of that, it was just he and I, 11 o'clock at night alone talking. But when you grow up in our household that there was, Trauma, trauma, trauma. Things happen in a household that should not happen to a kid. Yeah, and you're looking to get away from it, right? I mean, you're just looking to uh, numb it, not think about it anymore, and whatever can whatever the quickest thing is to take you away from it. I mean, yeah, it's no, it's and, no wonder you turn to yeah. what you turn so, to. So, but daily, you know, starting in my earliest memories, me and my brothers, it was you're not worth a bullet to shoot you with. You're not worth the salt that goes on your bread, wow. and you'll never amount to anything. And day after day after day after day, you're told this. Mm-hmm. But they were raising us just like they were raised, because my grandma and grandpa told them the same thing every day. So after a while, you start believing it. You're you still, I, you're still obviously Russ, very, very much uh, able to go back to that moment, you, you, as you tell us the story, the, that emotion comes through again, and it, it makes it to me all the more amazing that you were willing to sit down with camera crews and, and your family and kind of go back there again, physically back there. You, you revisited, you know, the, the places. What, yeah. was, what was that process like from a, from a documentary or movie standpoint where you had to physically set foot on places that probably emotionally you, you wished you'd never see again? Well, it was difficult. It, it was difficult. But I had, I felt, a mandate from Jesus that I will get glory if you tell the story. I will get glory. And you reach a place where uh, you've reached a place of maturity. You've reached a place of, uh, there's a lot of water under the bridge, and there's home, so much healing that's taken place that you can sit objectively and talk about it. But those memories and those feelings, they're still there, you know, even though you're healed. And I go back to talking about that young child, that nine year old boy, that 15 year old boy. Uh, 
And there's still something in my brain that it touches and it brings tears, even though I'm here. I mean, I'm well now, as well as I can be. That's got to be so refreshing. I When I do auditions at church, Russ, I, I have the chance to tell my story because I want I want to I want somebody to tell me their story in the way that I'm telling mine and I often right. I often get to places where I'm 11 or 15 where I, I had those moments with God kind of like you did and um, every time I say those about those moments I, I feel a little bit like you feel like when you're like those are some those are some of the most very real moments with God and with me that I've ever had and that I've that uh, it's just me and him, you know, kind of a thing. And I sense that from you and it's, it's just beautiful. So it's gotta be healing, uh, in some respects to talk about those moments where it was just you guys. And, uh, you knew that that was God and God was there and how cool that you can go and reflect. W- one of the things I'm like, I'm sure you're going to, we're, we're one of however many interviews you'll be doing, but like with this, after this, uh, you know, your, your documentaries come out, but like, is it hard having to talk about this, like reliving your, um, your pain, your redemption, you know, like you, if you follow John Chris at all, the Christian comedian, like he's, he's getting a lot of flack for, you know, not living his, uh, his, um, redemption out, I guess, you know, and he's just going back into doing comedy and I guess he did one, one or two big pieces on it. And then now he, then he's moved on. But like, um, you know, I've seen Michael English, you know, and like he's, he talks over concerts and concerts about, you know, the failure and different things and, and how God has used that. And it's like, how do you do that? How do you keep talking about that? You know, and keep reliving that. Is it hard? Well, it is, but it's also healing because every night, every interview, you're telling people the miracle that happened in you yeah, and it was a long miracle. And so it does build faith and it gives confidence of like, yes, he brought me through this. He can bring anybody through anything. And at the end of it, there, there is joy because I've talked about him. I've lifted him up and I've reminded myself right now today of the miracle that took place in my life. So it's joyous, but it's, it's hard, you know, it, 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 it is hard, but you you feel like you're giving people something to work with, you know, something to focus them. Um, I would imagine it, for it, somebody like you, it probably balances things out a little bit too, because how much have you been told in your life that you're amazing and you're gifted and all the things that you've done that have made such a difference, you know, and then, then now here's your platform to go like, yeah, well, let me let me balance that coin out a little bit here for you. You know, like <laughs> I don't know. Like speaking of which, if I could just throw this in, man, your voice is so gritty and cool. And wow. I remember I'm 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 in my mid forties, and I remember growing up listening to you and being like cutting my teeth on you and a bunch of those guys. And I'm like, and I remember when I heard you, I was like, that guy sings like a saxophone. I want to <laughs> sing like that. <laughs> Like just wow, just well, putting on the grit and just, the way you bend so, pitches. Like so you here's, are so. Here's a little grit right here. Oh. This is this is Russ with the Gaither Vocal Band. Listen to it. Russ, if we sat here for the rest of our time together <laughs> and just played a bunch of your musical selections from the past decades, we would be... That'd be fun. We'd be here with the Gaither Vocal Band. Let me get this in. I can't do this. And all his men. <laughs> we would be back to the mid or early 80s when Russ Taff was winning Grammy Awards for songs like I Listen to the Trumpet of Jesus. Um, there, There is such an incredible... Uh, library of songs that have your voice under them um it, it's probably even more amazing that while you were on the platform that while you were in the spotlight that while you are the number one recording artist in the country at the time that there was the pain being acted on behind the scenes that you were struggling can you take us through the timeline here we are in 1983 trumpet of jesus number one song 
And as you describe in the uh, movie, I still believe this is the time when the accolades are just pouring in. So what was it like to go from the preacher's kid who was not being treated well to being the, the bell of the ball to where everywhere you went, there was accolades, there were spotlights, there were offers, there were concerts, there were bookings and, and it was now Russ was on top of the world. How was that journey? What was that like? Well, um, I, I, I couldn't embrace it because I wasn't good. You know, I'm not worth the bullet to shoot me with. Uh, I remember yeah. winning uh, Grammys with the Imperials back in 1978, 79. And, and there's so much joy. And I'd get back to the hotel room, and within 45 minutes, it's gone because they made a mistake. You know, I'm not good enough. Wow. Uh, somebody else should have won. So all accolades were short-lived, short-lived, because after the high, it was quickly followed by, I'm not good enough. You know, I, I uh, and, and you're serving a Jesus that was so judgmental and hard and demanded perfection. You know, my daddy preached a hard gospel that he couldn't he couldn't live up to. So, and I'd never heard about grace. Didn't know a thing about grace. We all do now, you know. But back then, it was all works. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it, and you know, when I first started, I wasn't drinking at all. But I would have great nights, and I would go back to the bus, and and I'd cry, and I talked to Jesus, and it was like, "Do you like me now?" You know, I did good tonight for you. I saw people come to Jesus. Do you like me now? But I, I didn't know the Jesus that was kind and forgiving and loving and, and would get down into hell to get me out of there. Mm -hmm. It was all works. So I couldn't work hard enough to maintain that feeling every day. But going back, uh, you know, during that time of my life, I, I couldn't enjoy and. You know, my first night with the Imperials, I, I was in front of 6,000 people. The largest crowd I'd ever seen, it was 200. And and all of a sudden, you, you're thrown into this place. But it's so hard when God wants to give us the kingdom, but we don't feel we're worth it. So we won't take it. What, and, you, what you're sharing, by the way, and I'm sorry to jump in there, Russ. No, 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 but no. but I, I, I really want to drive home the point to our audience that words matter. Words from parents to children matter. Um, as you can tell, as Russ recounts some of the things that he was told, those are devastating daggers that go to the core. When somebody says you're not worth something, that is to the yeah. core of your being. That is, that is literally speaking about your existence and whether it should be a thing or not. And to yeah. hear you say, you know, you're not worth the bullet it would take to shoot you or the other expressions, you, you clearly heard them more than just once. And the devastating reach of that then still plays in your mind when you're, when you're the number one artist in the country. It still plays in your mind when you think you're going to have to give the Grammy back. It, yeah, still, it still plays in your mind when you're on the stage with the Gaither Vocal Band, which is, you know, the, the highest rung there is in, in gospel music. Um, words matter, folks. Words oh. matter. Mm -hmm. they, they do matter, and especially, you know, when it's said to a child 10,000 times. Uh, because the voice of God is your dad when you're little. You know, the voice of God is your mom, and when they don't think you're worth it, and they treat you that way, um, but yet they demand perfection. But that, that voice followed me. Uh, followed me and it haunted me and and I would just do my best to turn it off and that's why I, I never drank as a, you know in Nashville here uh, there's been times that uh, you know like my pastor has wine with dinner you know I don't judge anybody and it's between them and Jesus but for me I can't uh, but I was 26 years old and I was in New York Tori's brother my wife's brother played with the New York Philharmonic and his wife Cree danced to the American Ballet Theater. I'd never been to New York. I, you know, and 
so uh, museums and, and this and that. But but he wasn't a Christian. He, he had three Heinekens in the refrigerator. And they were friends back then, even when we would play golf. And we finished up 18 holes. Um, one of the guys would have a beer. You know, I never judged him. But I'd have a Coke and we'd all, all go home. But there were three Heinekens in the refrigerator. And uh, we were out of Cokes. And I thought, well, I'll just have one of those. This July 5th floor uh, uh, of the apartment building, hot. And so I, I popped open a Heineken. Innocent, innocent as it could be. Uh, everybody around me seemed to handle it okay. And I, but I just never touched it because of my dad. But that first Heineken, those voices got quieter. I mean, I can't tell you what that did inside of me. Those voices got quieter. And so I immediately had another one. And those voices got even quieter. Those condemning, judging voices uh, that... that uh, that God that demanded perfection and I wasn't good. I'm not good. Those voices got quieter. And by the third one, those voices were gone. And I promise guys, I lifted my hands to heaven and I began to worship God. And I said, I can live this way. Those voices are quiet. They're quiet. I feel okay. This must be the way the rest of the world feels. Not knowing that within just a short amount of time, it would turn on me. And I would become a slave and would go deeper in hell than I'd ever been in my life. But it started with this. And the next day I was praising God. And I told my wife, I said, this is just, I'm calm in my brain. Those voices are silent. I don't feel condemned all the time. Uh, but Well, the, the definition of most addiction is what? We, we dive into something else. To numb, right. numb some form of pain, and that's what, that's what it sounds like you're describing. And by the way, um, not to be overlooked in this conversation or certainly in the story of Russ Taff is the role that your wife played um, and continues to play. I think, yeah. Billy, uh, one of the things that came shining through in I Still Believe on Amazon Prime was when the two of them were sitting side by side. Oh, yeah. And she's not holding back. I know. You know, there's no there's no sugarcoating what she's been <laughs> through. And I'm like, he he married a good one right yeah. there, man. She says it how it is. Like, that's yeah. Tough. Are you yeah. as you sit here uh, talking to us in the fall of 2020, Russ? Are you as amazed that she's still by your side as viewers of the movie might be? Uh, some some for a long time I, I was. And bless her heart, she never brought it up. She never used it as as a, as a way to put me down. Uh, and she said the reason that she stayed is because I did the work. You know, it was years of therapy. I mean, therapy and going down into my childhood and dealing with those traumatic moments that I was trying to run away from. Um. And then the years of, of hating myself for the addiction part of it. And you talk about going to hell. I mean, when you're singing about Jesus and, and you are acting out like that, I couldn't look my face in the mirror. I couldn't look at myself to even shave. I couldn't look myself in the eye because I turned into something I hated more than anything. But my wife told me, she said, I watched you do the work. You know, I watched you fast. I watched you pray. You know, I watch you go to therapy and, and, and deal with these things. And she said, that's why I stayed because you did the work. And I fought for her. I fought for her. Uh, that, it, Way to go, Russ. You know, <laughs> yeah, but I felt, I really felt like if, if I lose her, I'm just going to spin out into oblivion. She was my last connection to any kind of sanity. But I remember her laying her hand on my back at night saying, devil, you're not going to take this one. God's got his hand on him. I mean, you're not going to take this one. And night after night, I would feel her hand on my back when she thought I was asleep. And she would claim me for Jesus. And she would claim me mm. by the blood of Jesus. And so 
all of this pain, all of this trauma, all of this explosion that happened in my life, I was able to find the real Jesus. That Jesus that if I was the only person alive on this planet, he would die for me because he loves me that much. 25 years ago, Mark Lowry sent me a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. Didn't have a clue what grace was. And so in the middle of all of this breaking, breaking, I opened my hands and I let go. And I said, I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you. Not doctrines, not religion, not sermon, not judgment on how I should live or what I should live, but I want to know you. But it took my world crashing and burning before I walked away from that God of my youth. And I began to look for this God of forgiveness and would would carry us, go into hell and get us. So with all of the tragedy and the pain and everything that, that we walk through, but I tell you what, when your wife fights for you <laughs> and, and she looks you in the eye and, and says, I'm not going to live this way. If you keep living this way, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Uh, and the intervention that they did and Gaither, you know, flew down from uh, Alexandria, Indiana. He heard that I was in trouble. And so 17 of my closest friends, up at a therapy session and I didn't know they were there and each one of them told me you're killing yourself we don't want to sit by and just watch you die and Gates are crying saying Russ don't live this way but the therapist told me when I walked out of there he said this much love really hurts doesn't it but they loved me and it took me a few days to see what how strong strong love is that it will call you out. It won't let you continue the way you're doing. Uh, but, but it took uh, everything in me to sit here in 2020 with a God that's crazy about me. I mean, absolutely crazy about me and, and raising my daughters with a God that, that, you know, is crazy about them just abs and watch watching them grow up free with a God that just loves them. And I look back at me when I was 15 and how just the self-hatred I had and that God did not like me. He did not like me. So the broken places in our lives lead us to changing. Russ, I, 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 you know, I'm young enough to be your son, man. And I, I, uh, but I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I am so proud of you. And um, I'm so proud that you represent the God that we love in this brokenhearted way. And um, I'm so glad that God has given you this platform to um, allow your heart to be broken like this. You remind me of King David, um, because that guy jacked it up. And man, he was a man after God's own heart, you know, and I, um, I'm so moved. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more moved by your how, how your heart now that I know you a little more because of your documentary. And I, I'm, I didn't... You know, it's hard to know that, to be more moved by somebody's heart than their giftedness, but, uh, you know, I am. And one of the things that moved me the most was uh, when that older gentleman who passed away prayed for yeah. you. And um, oh, I, felt, I felt like I got a glimpse into who, <laughs> who you really are yeah. and that yeah. humility before the, before the Lord and humility before someone who, who would offer, a, offer kindness to you and pray for you and, and that he looked like a little bit like your dad too. Man, I, I, like that just to me, like... I just saw, I saw, I saw like 12 year old Russ in that moment. I saw the, I saw 11 year old Russ that snuck out to grab mama's keys to go into the hospital, into, into the church and, and just talk to Jesus yeah. for a little while. Like, I felt like, like yeah. that, that's the Russ that like everybody needs to know, you know? And like, and, and even as you talk and you share and it still gets you way down deep, man, I'm just, I'm changed because of you and your story that way. And I'm, I'm so much drawn closer to the heart of God. And I'm so grateful for you. And let me jump in just for a quick second before you respond, Russ, and, and kind of recap the context of what Billy's referring to. Again, Russ Taff is the subject of the movie, I Still Believe. It's on Amazon Prime. And one of the most powerful moments 
I've ever seen on my TV screen in any form whatsoever took place in a hospital room where you were asked to just, would you please come and pray with my father because he's passing away? And what unfolded next in that moment, I think would, would, I think you defined it as your watershed moment. Yeah. The moment where you came to pray for somebody yeah. and ended up being prayed for. And I'll let you take it from here. Well, every year, Mark Lowry is one of my best friends in the world. And uh, every year there's about uh, four artists with their spouses. And we get together and, and uh, it's just three days of singing, talking, conversation, eating. Mark loves to eat. Um, but Mark's best friend went to a church there in Houston. And the pastor was dying of cancer. And he loved the documentary that Gaither did on me. He, he, uh, uh, he, he loved the songs. It's and, three o'clock. Sorry. Uh, that was me. <laughs> Apparently it's my three o'clock. <laughs> my, my computer was announcing. <laughs> he seems to be missing the appointment. Sorry. Uh, but his sons uh, that had taken over pastor of the church, they said, would Russ just come and, and sing. I mean, you know, just basically come in and wish him well and pray for him and just be with him because he loves Russ. And uh, th they told me that he had been pastoring for 44 years in Houston, uh, you know, burying people, marrying people, spending night after night in the hospital with people. I mean, to me, these guys are prophets of God. I mean, pastors are just they're prophets of God. I mean, they're down in the ditches with the work, with the, their, their flock, getting them out of ditches. And so I grabbed my acoustic and I told him I would go. And so, uh, Mark's friend took me to the hospital. His son met me at the, uh, at the door of the hospital room and just kind of filled me in on all that was going on and that he liked, he liked my voice. He liked my music. And would I just come in and say hello? And he saw my acoustic, and then it'd be great if you just sang him a song. So I opened the door. He opened the door, and I walked into that, that hotel room, and I froze. I just froze because he looked so much like my dad. Yeah. And I've done a whole lot of work repairing my heart with where daddy issues are concerned. I've worked very hard and made, I mean, strides of, great, great, great to be, to be a great dad that I am today because of, uh, but when I, I opened that door and I saw him and I froze, but I, you know, there's just times in our lives we both know, uh, you know, and, and when God calls us to do something, there's times we just got to suck it up. You know, if we have a 404 degree fever, you just got to suck it up. You got to be there Sunday. They're counting on you. Um, so I walked in and I took out my acoustic and I said, Bishop Jones, what do you want to hear? And he goes, Oh, do heartbreak Ridge and new hope road. So I played it on my acoustic and then he, he would just call out some others and his son, his sons had a couple they wanted to hear. So I was there about 45 minutes just singing with my acoustic and, and he had closed his eyes and he'd just roll his head and, and just enjoying it so much. And his wife kind of mentioned he's getting kind of tired. So, let's uh, uh let's kind of wrap it up so i was putting my acoustic back in in my case and all of them were thanking me for coming and um and as i was getting ready to leave he asked me he said russ would you pray for me and i i it was like how do you pray for a prophet <laughs> I mean, the guy that for 50 years that has been in that pulpit every Sunday and knows more about Jesus than I ever will and asked me to pray for him. And I was so intimidated. Uh, um, so I, uh, uh, I mumbled something, you know, as best I could. And, and, and before I even thought about it, I said, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I wanted to take those words back because I knew he was tired. And I thought he would just like, you know, uh, in his easy chair, just kind of take my hand and say a prayer. But he said, Russ, I would love to. 
And so he gets up out of that recliner in his hospital room. Oh. Excuse me, Freddie. But he stands up and he walks up to me, or I walk over to him, and I'm looking up into his, my dad was 6'2", I'm 5'10", and his blue eyes just like my dad, and big hands like my dad, white hair like my dad, and, and I'm just overwhelmed looking at this guy. And so I close, my eye and he begins to pray. And as he begins to pray, then he begins to affirm me like a dad would a son. Mm. The words you that never I heard. heard. No, no. And, and you didn't know how you were so looking for that until it happens. And it was like, it was like water and sand, a desert. And I'd never had that kind of affirmation from a father. And, and as he began to pray, I began to cry and he had his hands on my shoulders and I'm crying so hard. I fall to my knees and he takes my head and he pulls my head to his belly and begins to stroke my hair and begins to say, Russ, God loves you so much. He's so proud of what you've done with your life and that you're giving your gift to him. And the more he did it, the harder I cried. And it was one of those cries where it was just running everywhere, you know. Uh, and I don't know how long it went on. Some people said like 10 minutes. I, I don't know. But but something happened in those 10 minutes that uh, that God had ordained before the foundation of the earth. That day, that day was going to be the summation of my healing. He healed my mind. He healed my body. Uh, he healed my marriage, but that day he healed my spirit mm. that had been so just put through so much. Uh, but I left there a different person. I left there confident, secure, uh, an adult. You know, I, I wasn't this broken person walking around, you know, doing his best. I walked out of there, a man of God. Dad had affirmed me. Dad had told me how pleased he was with me and it changed me. It just changed me. But through the whole documentary, that's the one, that moment there, that was just for me, that supernatural moment where God shows up. You know, I did all kind of work, AA meetings and, and everything else that to, to get a hold of my uh, drinking. But that day was a supernatural moment where God just walked in and wrapped his arm around me and said, you're mine. You're mine. There's nothing you can do that can separate me from your love. Nothing. And so I'm, I'm glad that that moment ministered to you guys because it sure did me. <laughs> I, yeah. It about put me on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I, I was like wiping my tears like crazy in that yeah. moment, Russ. You know, like there's uh, two visual moments from Christian artists on on. Uh, on the on the screen that I've seen that have that I'll never forget in my entire life, one was uh, Kathy Tricoli when she was uh, on a missions trip of some kind, and the camera followed her and she walked around a corner and was crying and she said, "Please don't follow me," and yeah. uh, she was weeping so hard and crying so hard and uh, because of the desolate situation that those little babies were in and I'll never forget that broken heart that real broken heart she had and. Um, Russ, you're the second one, man. I'll never forget for my uh, from as long as I live, um, b because all the words that you just said uh, was was summed up in your actions and your crying and your raising of hands and your bowed head, and um, uh, that was just one of the most holy moments I've ever I've ever seen in my life. And, and Russ, one of the things that it delivered to me, along with some tears that my wife and I were both uh, shedding while we watched that, is is the hope that that conveys to somebody who right now is either watching our video conversation or listening to the podcast or to the radio program who's wondered if there's ever any hope for them, that they've struggled with an addiction for so long, mm -hmm. that, they've, that they've burned every bridge they have, and that they've been told things that they should never have been told, much like you endured. And in that moment, I was reminded that there is hope that there is a path forward, that there is a God who, as the current, the newer song says, will will kick down every wall, will, will tear down every lie, and it, it's the you know it's that song, reckless love, or 
I could go back to the song we played earlier from the vocal band that you're singing, and it says, I, I, I fell into a trap, I made myself, but the Lord came through. Yes. So as we wrap up our time together, and you've been very kind uh, being with us, oh, sure. what sure. message, what message do you want our audience to take away from both this conversation and from I Still Believe? First of all, one thing I would say is God's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. Uh, People around you or the church might be because you keep messing up. But God's not mad at you. Um, And more than you, God wants you well. Not only does he want you well, but he will give you power to get well. Uh, He will give you power to overcome this thing that's kicking your butt. Uh, he will give you power to to uh, get your marriage back together. You know, he will give you power over the trauma of your childhood that you can't let go of. But it all comes back to you. Will you be made whole? Will you step up and say, God, I will do whatever it takes to get well? And that's where I was. I had tried you know, all kind of remedies and stuff like that. But when I felt like the Holy Spirit say, would you do whatever it takes to get well, I will meet you right there. And that's when I said, God, I will do whatever it takes, whatever you ask me to do, whatever, whatever men of God that I respect ask me to do, I will do it. And I got a support system around me that I could be honest with. Not those guys that are, were fans, you know, we both know, we all have fans in our lives, the three of us that, you know, we want them to see our good side. And so we won't really, uh, but there were several men in my life that walked that road with me and Gaither was one of them. Hmm. The times in treatment and I would go and I'd call him and I'd say, Bill, I, I, I'm at that point. I need help again. And he said, go Russ, we're here for you. If you need anything, call us. But just having people in your life that will ride this thing with you. It's like a roller coaster. You don't just get down on your knees and walk up and, you know, get up and walk away completely well from years of addiction. But some people, I guess it's happened to not, not for me, but you can't lose hope. There is hope. Uh, and God will meet you right where you are. If, if I, if I have, I have three more minutes, if I can have three more minutes. Absolutely. There is that, I, I'm trying to remember what chapter, it's Matthew, I think, where the, the man had been at the pool with that 38 years, and the angel would come and trouble the water, but he never could get there in time. <laughs> and Jesus asked him the strangest question, I thought. He said, will you be made whole? I mean, it's like, duh, Jesus, of course, of anybody, you know. But what I thought he was saying and all the stuff that I went through, he said, you can't live with that crippled mentality anymore. If I heal you, you're going to have to put action to this. You're going to have to go home and be a dad. You're going to have to get a job. You're going to have to change everything about you to become a man. Now, are you willing to do that? You know, I, 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 because if I heal, you're still, all you know how to do is be a beggar. That's all you've done for 38 years. But if you are willing to do the work, if you're willing to become a dad, if you're, if you're willing to get your marriage back together, uh, you know, if you're willing to get a good job for your family, then yeah, I'm, I'm here to heal you. But I don't know how many times God has asked me through my life, are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to do those things it takes to get you well? Because if you are, I will meet you right there. I can't do it for you. But if you're willing to take those steps, I will be right there with you every step of the way, giving you power to overcome those things that's killing you. But that's what the Jesus that I found. I have to take the steps. I have to go, yes, I have to get off my butt and go to where, you know, or Gator says, go where the food is. You know, I, you can't bring them to, you got to go get it. And so for people that have any kind of addiction or marriage is on the rocks and you're begging God for help, you know, your kids are, are, are wherever they're at. And that, it's like, God, what can I do today? 
what can I do to take step forward? Help me forgive my kids. You know, help me forgive my wife. Uh, you know, help me with this, this addiction that's plugging, pl- plugging me every day. But, and God, I will do whatever it takes to get well. I will. I will do it. And I know I'm going to mess up and mess up and mess up till I get it right. And he said, I'm right there with you. I know that. I know that. But, man, I'm walking. I'm holding your hand. You're not going to go down as long as I got a hold of you. But that gave me strength to keep fighting. And I fought and I fought and I fought till finally I walked out free. But uh, I would just tell your listeners and, 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 and the people that you pastored uh, that, that he is an amazing God. He never gives up on his kids. And no matter how far down the scale you've gone, it's not far from his love. You know, you can't go, you can't go to hell or any lower than that, that he can't reach you there. And he wants you well. And he's not holding anything over your head. You know, he's not mad at you. In fact, I have a friend and a pastor in St. Louis that he built this mega church. And he said, for two years, all I preached in all kind of different ways is St. Louis. God's not mad at you. And he said, people just started flocking to the church. Because of the way that, that people have been raised in the church, that we control them out of fear. But when people realize, God's not mad at me. He's on my side. He wants me to get well. And he will give me power to get well. My Lord, man, you'll run to that Jesus. <laughs> you know? Well, and you're... I'm sorry. I go on and on and on about this. But you, you... How many people, how many people that God has done a miracle in gets to do a documentary that takes you from the beginning to the end. And you can see with your own eyes, this incredible mega miracle that happened. I mean, I am so blessed that God allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and just like right now, sharing it with you guys, it fires me up. You know, I want to go write a song about it. (laughs) You know, I can't wait till, till next weekend till I can go out and say, and talk about it more because it, it heals me. Every time I do it, it heals me more. Well, it fires us up as well. It's so inspirational. And uh, thank you for not only sharing your time with us here, but for sharing your story with the world. I, I, I don't know how many people have seen I Still Believe. It's got to be in the millions, and it's frequently mentioned on social media. Um, when, I, when I invited Billy to come be part of this conversation, I think the same night or the next night, he went and watched it and sent me a Kleenex box emoji because <laughs> it's powerful stuff. And uh, I can't thank you enough, Russ. You, uh, uh, man, what a story. You've inspired a lot of people. And uh, keep up the great work. And um, we can't wait to hear your next musical uh, inspiration because we know they're not done yet. Can I, can I say a prayer for you guys? Absolutely. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And I thank thank you for the call that you've placed on Bill and Billy's life. That they have surrendered to the ministry. And they have laid down their lives to work for you. God, I pray that you would bless them at every turn that you would heal them at every turn and give them power and strength to keep sharing the message of Jesus Christ. Love them special today. Bless their families. Jesus name. Amen. I cannot think of a better way to conclude our time together. Russ, thank you. Bill and Billy, thank you guys very, very much.